key to 2024 is to be well diversified. At this point, you're really trying to time it, right? To wait for any increase in rates. This policy normalization that we see and swelling in the economy is going to be a boon for the duration trade in 2024. In the last four to five weeks, risk on is now taking precedence over risk off. This rally that, that we're seeing now, um, you know, is sort of the pain trade and evidence. You know, I, I've been calling it weaponized FOMO. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Indeed, the T-shirts, the caps, and the jackets are coming for weaponized FOMO. We kind of love that. Hey, everybody, feels like the last gap's gains in trade is kind of on, although I should point out Europe and U.S. futures are definitely off their highs on this Thursday. The story of the morning, we know it's like the market gods heard Mattis yesterday. Global bonds on track for their best two-month gain on record. U.S. Treasury market, by the way, on course for a second straight steep monthly gain as well. As for the equity side of things, let's talk U.S. Dow closed at a record, Sox at a record. What happened to Katie's S&P 500? It is just really taking its sweet time getting to that all-time <laughs> high. I said it this yesterday. It feels like the quietest all-time high in quite they a while. They heard your unchanged, unchanged, unchanged. I, I put it out into the universe. Maybe I'm going to get it. It would be great to get a perfectly unchanged day. A very good morning, everybody, from New York City for our global audience. This is, of course, Bloomberg Surveillance live on radio and TV alongside Manis Cranny and Katie Greifeld. I'm Carol Masser. Two more trading days left here in 2023. Question is, do we get that record high? And if we get that record high, what happens as we go into the new year? There's a wonderful uh, chart that we've got. This is breaking all the surveillance rules, but they're away. So what the heck? Hey, Let's show the Tom, chart. Tom, John, and Lisa Tom, are away. Tom, John, and Lisa are away, and I'm going to crush it with a chart. This is actually what happened. We talked about whether you want to be in the Magnificent Seven going into 2024. Can you avoid them? Well, the point about it is in the first half of the year, you had this magnificent outperformance of the Magnificent Seven beating the S&P 500. So the real trajectory was in the first six months. And in the back six months of the year, hmm. you really have this slightly more muted outperformance. That's a 100 great chart. Wow. We should break rules Seven. More John, often. Lisa, and Tom a <laughs> note and say we found a chart that worked for us. I'm going to do a deep tease. We have Kathy Wood later on, right? Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, disruption, innovation. She's crypto. We have a lot to ask her about. But I am curious what she has to say about the Magnificent Seven and what the tech trade maybe holds for 2024. Exactly. Where she sees the spots right now, the opportunities. We know uh, when we look at her holdings, it's a lot of crypto. It's a lot of Tesla. It's not a lot of NVIDIA, for example. It's going to be interesting to see if she's really buying into this AI narrative because you think about that chart, you think about that big line up the first half of the year, a lot of that was AI euphoria. And of course, we've got to talk to her about the overnight story in regards to how she's shuffling the deck. She was in Australia just at the end of last year, yeah. evangelizing on Grayscale as being one of her top holdings. That shifted the gears. But of course, there could be technical reasons for that. So we'll Absolutely. dig a little bit deeper. Absolutely. So much to talk about. And we do want to kind of get to our first guest because we have a lot to talk yeah. about um, with her as well. Barbara Ann Bernard, she's founder, CEO and CIO at Wincrest Capital. Joining us, Barbara Ann, um, welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance uh, on a day where it's been quiet the last two couple of days. Today feels like there's a little bit more activity. How are you thinking about the markets as we get ready to wrap up the year and start a new year? Well, I love your weaponized phone. Comment. <laughs> it's great, right? <laughs> yeah, it's super. I think the market's been giddy because the data recently has been better than expected and we've had lower inflation. But I would warn that if you buy future earnings on the basis of historical data, you're driving with the rearview mirror. And the reason we're having lower inflation is because we have lower demand. And so um, I think this has been, you know, pent up demand chasing a rally, but I'm not sure how sustainable it is. And we want to put it out there that, you know, we like talking to smart people. You are smart. You called it right when it when we talked about inflation. I think it was back in what about 2021, June of 2021. Our Bloomberg putting out a story. You were among those in terms of inflation wouldn't be transitory. You were right. Um, so welcome, congratulations, good call. How are you thinking about what happens in terms of the economic environment next year? Then, because it does sound like maybe you have a little bit of trepidation. Yeah, I just think the word inflation is a tricky one to unpack because there's so many sources and inputs to inflation and any one of those can dominate and sometimes in head scratching ways. Like if you look at this year, it's been perplexing. Who could have predicted that you would have home sales down 6% year on year coinciding with a bull market in house prices, which were up 5% year on year in October. So there, right, the source of inflation is not strong demand. You have lower sales. It's an inelastic supply curve. So I don't think you can paint inflation with one brush, 
But what I can paint is a picture where longer term, we're going into a more structurally higher inflationary environment where you can have short term deflationary shocks. Um, and the long term as a catalyst, if you will, are undeniable. You have an aging population. The young and the old are consumers. Um, you have geopolitics where you know, were having near shoring, French shoring, and the supply chain is going from a just in time to a just in case or a China plus one mentality. You look at commodities and there's just this huge underinvestment. You look at peak oil. OPEC's never had more demand or not more control. And then when you just think more fundamentally, there are only three ways to fight a debt burden. And the history of Western democracy is the easy way out. Those three ways are default, deflate, uh, default or inflate or grow your way out. And I think we will inflate our way out. So longer term, I absolutely think we will we are in a more inflationary environment. But shorter term, I think you can have lower growth. Um, and that can Barbara, bring good morning. Good morning. I mean, th there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, if I look through the narrative that you've given us, you are skeptical on the inflows into ETS. You're skeptical on the inflation story, as you've just said there. And you're also skeptical on the Fed put. So as I go into 2024 with that level of perhaps uh, questionability, do you think that we see some near-term realization in these markets and a drawdown given that level, that trifecta of skepticism that you outline? Well, I'm a contrarian by nature. You just look at the equity ETFs and they absorb 69 billion to date in December, right? We're reminded of Bob Farrell's rule, the public buys the most of the top and the least of the bottom. Or Sir John, you want to be greedy when others are fearful um, and fearful when others are greedy. And right now I would be fearful because others are greedy. So I How think- How fearful are you? How fearful are you? Are you a, a, mod a moderate one to 2% will catch your breath and we won't get the record high that Katie is baying for? <laughs> are you saying, actually, there's gonna be a, a quite a day of reckoning, bond yields are falling for all the wrong reasons, uh, and this market is gonna get a, 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 a smack? What I wouldn't be doing is piling in to an ETF here that is heavily weighted towards the Magnificent Seven. What I do see in 2024 is a more broadening out um, of performance. And where I think if you want to have alpha, you're going to have to be contrarian. And so if I look at my top contrarian ideas, they would be one commodities, two India, and three China. China is the most hated market in the world right now. Yeah. It, we're into three and four years of declines. This is unprecedented. And when sentiment is so negative, it doesn't take much to, to, to change um, valuations and, and inflows. And if you just look in November, the Chinese PPI actually registered a 50.7 versus 49 and a half the month before. And that's the fastest expansion in three months. So I, I think I think you have to get creative here. Um, I, I, you know, the big seven, they did very well this year because they cost they cost, uh, co they had cost cutting. Can they do that again next year? in arguably a lower growth environment. You know, Trendy. we haven't been talking about a lot, but the CSI 300 uh, up 2.3% overnight to cap its best day in five months. So it's all like investors were kind of recognizing China mm -hmm. as we get ready to wrap up the year. Too. Yeah, maybe uh, that catch up starting, but uh, it's really interesting to hear you say that about China, Barbara, and uh, just a story on the terminal today, even uh, you have Goldman, you have Morgan Stanley, just among some of the big banks, uh, big bank economists out there expecting that China's housing slump will persist, as you said, I mean, sentiment is, is very negative on Chinese assets right now. But, I mean, talk to us about the fundamentals. Do you see the fundamentals improving, or is this a catch-up trade that you're expecting? So I don't – the housing market in China bursts, and when bubbles burst, they don't typically reflate. So I don't think your source of growth is going to come from housing, and that will continue to be a headwind. I also think that is the opportunity in commodities. Globally, they are pricing in recession because demand in China is so weak. So as a contrarian, I really like that because if I'm wrong and growth um, is stronger than I expect, those commodities should do very well because the underlying prices will do well and demand will grow. And if I'm right and we're going to have higher rates for longer and lower growth, those commodities should also do well because it's tightening the coil because those are such capital intensive industries that higher rates make it more expensive to fund mining and uh, mine development. So the, this is the kind of uh, asymmetry that I like. Where is there enough downside already priced in where the downside's taken care of and my upside is three to one? 
And let's stay overseas in emerging markets because you also mentioned India as one of your top contrarian ideas. And usually when we're talking to people about EM, or at least myself, uh, they're really bullish on India or they're feeling positive about India at the expense of China. But that's not necessarily your view. No, I just think, you know, India is a relatively safe environment right now because it's growing 7% a year. Um, you have inflation falling to 4%. You have productivity growing at 2.5% this year. And you have political stability, given it looks like Modi will be reelected. Um, that, that's, that, that's, that's great. And the other thing is, I would say the U.S. is just expensive. If you look at the S&P, it's on 23 times earnings. And the MSCI All Country World XUS is on 15. Right. So when I can get twice the growth for half the multiple, I get excited. And I think India is a relatively safe play and a beneficiary of people being so bearish on China because it's really the only other emerging market that's big enough to absorb those EM fund flows. Um, I was recently in Saudi and I'm really bullish on the 2030 vision. And I think there's some great um, tailwinds there as well. But I don't right. know how contrary it is. Those are some interesting areas to think about. I, when you were talking about India, when you were talking about China, Barbara Anna, I am curious about how would you suggest investors play that? Do they buy a basket? Um, what's what's the smart strategy and how much exposure? Because I would say, safe to say, when it comes to China, just because of the geopolitics and the wrangling we see back and forth, that you have to have kind of a bit of a strong stomach again. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I'm not an index investor. I'm a stock picker. And um, the Chinese consumer has been relatively re, relatively resilient, particularly in domestic travel. So we like the Macau gaming companies. And in India, you have India's a tricky market because not everyone can buy it. But there are some listed companies in the US like Make My Trip, which is the Expedia of India, which um, is a great company. It's got a fantastic balance sheet, wonderful um, ROE. Um, wonderful alignment of interest with the founders, and we think it's got terrific runway. All right, going to leave it there. Um, and by the way, hashtag we love stock pickers, so it love the specificity. Barbara Ann, thank you so much. Barbara Ann Bernard of Wincrest Capital, Happy New Year. Um, so great to have her here as we get ready to wrap up, and I feel like she kind of gives us some different things to think about. Let's, though, think about a little bit where we are in terms of the market setup. We're a few hours away from the U.S. Open, uh, and you are seeing Futures, once again, almost unchanged there. Uh, 48.34, trying to see if we get some kind of Katie record. Game. <laughs> yeah, just not getting there. Uh, so 48.34 on S&P 500. Futures, 111. Uh, when we look at the euro dollar exchange, uh, that 10-year note, um, 3.81. Yeah. Haven't seen yields go up in a while. No. Was... Well, we had pretty good auction yesterday, and mm -hmm. you saw the fives and thirties all drop, tens drop by 10 basis points. So there is, uh, you know, okay, 24 hours, and we're still seeing that demand for the deepest. As Katie said when she came on set, she, you know, we had this Josh about, <laughs> you know, look beyond borders for returns. There is a global bond market rally everywhere, and the Brits were out in front. They got a sub 4% print. But of course, it's the depth and liquidity depth and liquidity of the U.S., world's the mighty U.S. Bond, bond market. World's baby. biggest bond market. Might not be deliver the best returns in 2024. We are not going to this down. No, no. no. But we do have another auction to look forward to today. Uh, that's Could we trip note. over ourselves? Yeah. <laughs> that has to be the last one, right? I think that's the final one of the year. Uh, but like Mana said, I mean, we've seen strong demand yeah. this week. But it makes sense. Yeah. If investors are anticipating lower rates down the road, right, those auctions look a lot more attractive. Might as well get in on the ground floor and uh, buy in the primary market there. Yeah, exactly. Um, we We've got some great stuff coming up. Uh, we're looking forward to talking about the European bond market, the global bond rally. That's a, a little gift to Manus. Um, and I am thinking a lot. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we're going to talk currencies in just a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're also going to talk about Kathy Wood and kind of I'm curious maybe what she has to say about China yeah. coming off of the conversation we just had. Our next guest actually is not so positive on China. So it'll be a good contrast. But Kathy Wood coming your way at 7.30 a.m. Wall Street time on radio and TV. We've had a couple of stories just hitting the Bloomberg this morning. All right, everybody, as we said, though, coming up next, 7 a.m., uh, Sonia Martin of DZ Bank. We are going to talk about China. She believes China will not be a positive story next year. Uh, she's also going to talk a lot about what's going on in global currencies. You're watching and listening to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is Bloomberg. What was the cause of the United States Civil War? Well, don't come with an easy question or anything. I mean, I think the cause of the Civil War was basically how government was going to run, the freedoms and what people could and couldn't do.
Thank you. And in, in the year 2023, it's astonishing to me that you answer that question without mentioning the word slavery. What do you want me to say about slavery? No, um, uh, you've answered my question. Thanks. That, of course, was Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley speaking at a town hall in New Hampshire, responding to a question from a voter about the cause of the U.S. Civil War. The voter stunned when Haley didn't use the word slavery in her response. The first GOP contest is in Iowa on January 5th. Welcome back, everybody. Of course, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. Carol Masser, along with Katie Greifeld and Manis Cranny. Um, let's do a market check, although I've got to feel like Mm-hmm. Markets yeah. are going to be... <laughs> Get a nice lunch on the Does nobody want to touch that? Um, <laughs> it's yours, Carol. All yours. Markets are going to be thinking about these presidential candidates. Yeah. Or will they? Will they care about something like that? Uh, on this Thursday, though, with two trading days left in 2024 here in the United States, S&P 500 futures are flat, 48.33. Uh, Kud, I do want to bring your attention to it because it continues to move to the downside. We've talked about the war trade, about concerns about the Middle East. New York crude, 73.27, 84 cents to the downside in that 10 year 381. As we said, we haven't seen days where we're seeing the yield tick up a little bit higher there, but we're certainly seeing it. Um, but I do think about politics, geopolitics, which is why we talk about crude a lot this week. Um, whether it's going to be those November elections, uh, the world is watching our presidential election and these candidates. Um, I will say Nikki Haley in some of the debates that we've seen up to this point certainly has a fair amount of knowledge when it comes to the global stage. And that, many would argue, is very timely, considering all of the pressures that are out there right now. Well, if you look at the geopolitical stage at the moment, you've got half the sea containers routes of the world are in peril because of the Israel-Hamas war. You have a Congress that's incapacitated in terms of how to help in this hot war between Israel-Hamas, between Ukraine. There's still no funding. We're going to face off uh, literally face off those issues this mm -hmm. week. So the American position on its international position, as it were, as the number one ally and support is now very, very seriously in question. Therefore, it reduces Blinken's capacity and passport when he goes to the Middle East. That was one of the lines from one of our guests yesterday. That is not to say the America is dissipated in its function. It's just how the world perceives America. Yeah, exactly. I will point out the Biden administration did announce yesterday $250 million in weapons and equipment for Ukraine. So it's final package of the year. I know, just squeezing. It's nowhere near um, what they need, is no, it? No, really? exactly. And officials are pressing Congress uh, to renew that aid in the new year. All right. So a lot to get to with James Lucier. He is senior political analyst at Capital Alpha Partners joining us on this Thursday. Uh, James, nice to have you here with us. Um, when you look at the situation in the Middle East, uh, mm -hmm. Department of State here in the United States, Antony Blinken getting ready to go overseas trying to create some calm or find some res resolution when it comes to what's going on in the Middle East. How are you sizing up the situation on this Thursday? Well, I think people around the world are looking for decisive action from the U.S., but that's not really President Biden's style. He's more of a process manager, and he has a terrific national security team consisting of Anthony Blinken and Jake Sullivan, but they're also process guys. And I think that what the world needs now is a sort of decisive signal that the United States is going to break out of the steady-as-we-go path with Ukraine and also our steady-as-we-go try to maintain some semblance of restraint in Israel and just choose a side one way or the other and start moving. Well, what is it that takes, good morning, James, what is it that takes the White House to, to shift? Blinken goes on this trip. It's his fourth to the Middle East. It's his fifth to Israel. Uh, and our guests this week have said that his hand is not very strong when it comes to negotiating with Bibi Netanyahu because of this delay, and it may well be overcome this month, this delay in funding. Is the U.S. Uh, in a less powerful position to push Netanyahu at this juncture? Well, I think the United States is absolutely in a less powerful position to push Netanyahu because we can't pass the funding either for Israel or Ukraine. I do think, actually, that we'll get that funding passed about the middle of next month. But you also have to look at the situation on the ground in Israel, where you have a rare unanimity among the political elites in Israel that they, they want to prosecute the war, they want to finish it. Uh, they're really past caring what the world thinks of them. 
And I think the Biden administration overestimates the amount of leverage they have because they really aren't as linked to the Israeli political situation as uh, as they could be. Or they're trying to run the world from Washington and not from Tel Aviv. Well, James, bring this conversation to, of course, the 2024 presidential election, because you think about Biden, the candidate, trying to handle this uh, fraught geopolitical landscape. You have two hot wars going on in the world right now. How does that play into the voting booth? Will American voters be voting when, on geopolitical issues or more concerned about the U.S. economy and domestic issues? Well, I'd point out that you have two hot wars and a border crisis going on. And Anthony Blinken obviously was in Mexico yesterday. I think a key move for the Biden administration is to come up with some sort of border deal, not to send Blinken to Mexico, but to send Joe Biden himself to Capitol Hill to cut a deal on some sort of border arrangement and thus release the funding for Ukraine and Israel. Um, that's really key to the equation. Now, in terms of geopolitics, people are voting geopolitics. They're voting geopolitics perhaps in the state of Michigan. President Biden has got a significant problem with younger generation voters. Uh, part of this is due to the economy and inflation, but a big part of it, too, is this uh, perception that uh, you know Gaza is a humanitarian catastrophe, as in fact it is. But this is hurting Biden very badly with younger voters and uh, swing votes in key states like Michigan. So um, the the presidential election is very well going to be influenced by by events in Israel so, and what Biden does. So, James, what are you telling some of your clients and your customers in terms of the outcome come November here in the United States for the election? Well, you know, I spent most of last year telling people that I was really skeptical the candidate would be uh, Donald Trump on the Republican side. I didn't think Biden would run again or would last again. But clearly, we do have a Trump-Biden dichotomy. And the reality is that if you look at the swing state polls, it's not only closely matched, but uh, probably Donald Trump might be the favorite candidate to win, uh, given his strong and intense support and Biden's rather shaky support. Now, I'm not sure that's how things shake out at the end of the day. I hope it doesn't. But, um, you know, we're definitely going to be in a different type of presidential race here. I think that the uh, Supreme Court and its role in deciding whether or not Donald Trump uh, stays in the ballot, its role in deciding how the uh, trials of Donald Trump proceed, that's going to play a very high role in the election. James, and, yeah. very briefly, you also advise on energy and energy policy and climate policy in Washington. And to that end, I'm curious, record U.S. oil production, record U.S. exports. So does it matter who wins the White House next year for big oil? How are you advising them? Because Trump himself says, you know, drill, drill, drill. And obviously, oil, big oil has done well under Biden. Briefly, what are you saying to the oil well, it, it does matter because uh, we're talking about uh, the energy transition and how many years the U.S. oil and gas industry has left. There's no question they would have a longer, uh, longer period of time to operate under a different president. There's no question that we have record output this year, but given oil prices, that, that output probably would have been even greater if um, we hadn't had the uh, Biden administration's policies to grind down U.S. production. So, um, yeah. you know, I, I think that on the whole, uh, uh, the oil and gas industry is going to be doing very well for quite some time. Tighter supply means higher prices. Um, not right. sure it makes it. Big. Well, yep, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but bottom line, a lot when it comes to politics domestically as well as globally. Yeah. But some great thoughts in terms of what it means for energy specifically. Hey, James, thank you so much. James Lucier of Capital Alpha Partners joining us here on Bloomberg Surveillance. All right, everybody, uh, coming up next, we're going to check in with Jeff Yu of BNY Mellon on the European bond market. Really, as we've been saying, one of our big headlines, global bonds on track for their best two-month gain on record. So what happens in 2024? We're watching global central banks. Who moves first? Who cuts first? Who is more aggressive? A lot to talk about. Don't go anywhere. This is Bloomberg.
From New York City, for our audiences worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Alongside Manis Cranny and Katie Greifeld, I'm Carol Master. It is Thursday, two more days of trading here in the United States. Let's get you set up on this Thursday in terms of the market trade. Uh, again, I feel like a broken record, but S&P 500 futures, not at a record. Didn't close at a record yesterday, but we're kind of close. Uh, hard to say whether or not we'll get there. Uh, 48.32 on those futures, just down, call it unchanged, just down about 0.75. Uh, NASDAQ uh, 100 futures, though, a little bit of uh, strength there, 0.2%, mm, but nonetheless, some momentum when it comes to the tech trade. Russell 2000, which was the outperformer in yesterday's trade, um, outperforming those bigger caps. Are you yawning? <laughs> I'm sorry. You're oh, right. my God. Yeah. She's yawning. You're talking about small caps. I was thinking about how tired the you're small caps You're going to get invigorated right. by right. the Russell 2000 next year. You oh. yawn. You hold on. Let's go back to the boards. Uh, do you want to bring up treasuries and see what's going on there? Because uh, we did see some <laughs> upward momentum. I could get excited about this. All right. She's not yawning anymore. 425 is the two-year note. Uh, we've got that 10-year note up slightly, too. Uh, two basis points, uh, 381, uh, and you've got that uh, 30 year at 3.97. So, uh, obviously, key when we think about what's going on in the mortgage market. Mm -hmm. The yeah. whole curve is under 4%. The that is curve. exciting. Yeah. It yeah, is just wait wild, for the banks right? to come off the price. They're pricing mortgages at 8%. I was with a friend yesterday looking at property in Midtown, okay? Uh, not me, not me. He was. You can, you can say it. Eight percent. Eight. You're among friends. You're among friends. Come on. It wasn't, Share my, a little. It wasn't my budget. I assure Share you. A little. I don't even have a credit history in this country for goodness <laughs> sake. I've got a Bank of America card. And that's it. We'll vouch 8%. for you. Eight percent. Eight mm. percent. Yeah. And the limited. What's amazing is the limitation of products that are available. Yes. It's fix and bust unless you go to an alternative bank. Anyway, we're not supposed to be talking hey, about rates, if you can't buy an apartment, maybe you could buy an Apple Watch, because it turns out you actually can now. Let's get to some of the other headlines. <laughs> Under surveillance on this Thursday morning, Apple resuming sales of its smartwatches after the U.S. Court of, of uh, Appeals um, lifted the ban while the company seeks to overturn the decision. Now, Apple was found to have infringed on two Massimo patents relating to its blood oxygen sensor, but says a new software update mitigates the issue. A decision on whether that update will be deemed adequate is due January 12th. So another deadline to watch. Apple shares just up 0.3%. So the watches, they will be back on shelves beginning Wednesday at some of Apple's about 270 retail locations across the country. Uh, wider availability by Saturday. So I don't know, maybe buy them quick if you really want to buy them. I wonder one. if there's going to be a rush. Like all of a sudden you're going to get like a pop and does, Apple's going to be like, everybody's like a, buying. A collector's item? I don't know what happens well, here. No. Well, I, if you are concerned that uh, this is going to... Oh, you mean don't forget, there's going. alternative products. She's got the alternative product on, I do on, on her a, arm. I, mean, like, we, on I don't think we're allowed to say what products they are. I think what's interesting is that the White House has sort of sort of backed uh, off yeah. a little bit on this, yeah. Catherine Tai, uh, on Tuesday, that she wouldn't intervene, and the White House refused uh, to veto the measure, and so that's sort of standing back from it. Of course, we've had a valuation this week. We've had Wedbush Securities on the show uh, talking mm -hmm. about a $4 trillion valuation. Not worried. Not, no. and very to bullish on China. You know, the, the China burrs on China yeah. have, in his in his words, been very, very wrong. Dan Ives, so it's uh, get, your bull, get your bulls out for uh, Apple. You talk to Full ball. Full ball. Full ball. Full ball. Um, you mentioned China. We get a little ball. Let's talk about Chinese housing. We just talked about it with one of our guests. The slump in China's housing construction set to continue into 2024, which jives with what she had to say. This, though, is coming from analysts over at Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and a few other banks. That would leave China with three straight years of contraction. The analysts are citing declining real estate sales, leaving developers with less incentive to start construction as a key reason. Yeah, who wants to build into this market? Um, yeah, it's rough. It's the one thing... Uh, not the only one thing, but a major thing over in China that the officials really haven't been able to kind of resolve. It's been a huge store of wealth. It's been the propagation, you know, under Xi, mm -hmm. there was this magnificent empowerment of the middle class. If you look at real estate investment, it's down 8% in the first 11 months of this year. And for the whole of last year, uh, there was a drop of 8.4%. So that just gives you a sense. I mean, you see images of these ghost towns, you see images of these cities, you see other networks have gone out there and they've done, they've done the, the sort of investigation. So it's about middle class wealth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it's interesting that even though you've had this drip, drip, drip of stimulus tried to, to, trying to rather arrest this decline, uh, yeah. it hasn't been successful at this point. I don't know what the uh, inflection point is for China, but I'm sure uh, the global investment community would love to know. But definitely a drag and continues to 
be one. All right, one more for you, the global debt market. Wait, did we say this? Yes, we did. It's on track to post its biggest two-month gain on record as traders ramp up expectations for rate cuts in 2024. Bloomberg's Global Aggregate Total Return Index lifting nearly 10% in the past two months with recession risks underscoring the case to own bonds. What I will say is I do feel like from the conversations we've been having this week is that yeah. people are kind of pulling back a little bit maybe on those aggressive moves, but at the same time, I also feel like there's a little bit of momentum that, hey, folks, it might not ultimately be a soft landing, and maybe the Fed's going to be have to, have to be more aggressive. What you know, and when we hear those positions, what does that tell us? about the outlook. Should we be a little bit worried? It really feels like the writing is on the wall because in both cases, you still have the Fed, you still have global central banks cutting rates and you translate that uh, into you know the global curves and people are bidding for mm -hmm. duration here. Even though you do have some central banks, I'm thinking about the ECB, et cetera, uh, pushing back against those expectations hasn't been landing. Well, Lagarde tried to push back on, you know, we're not going to cut that soon and that early, and that was pushed back against. The, the view in the market is 175 basis points from the ECB. So that is more than the Fed mm -hmm. and more than the mm -hmm. Bank of England. So it's he who he or she who cuts first wins the race. It's a race that none of them want to win. None of them want to win. <laughs> I know. It's amazing to watch. But just remember, if you know, you've got global central banks cutting aggressively, what does that say about economic growth, the underlying growth fundamentals? Like how worried do On we On the buy to side, they tell us it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. It always matters, doesn't it? All right. Good guess we've got to get to. Jeff Yu is senior market strategist over at BNY Mellon. We do want to talk about what we're seeing uh, when it comes to this global bond market rally. Jeff, does it continue into 2024? Uh, well, broadly, looking at the easing cycle, um, I guess bonds will do well. You know, we're seeing in our underlying flows that people are going into duration. That has too much been priced in too soon, I would say, for the Fed. Yes, I would say for the ECB, uh, no. So going back to your point about Madame Lagarde you know, about Chair Powell, uh, they're all pushing her back against easing right now. I would just say these pushbacks, some are a bit more credible than others. So they're pushing back. Lagarde is desperately pushing back. We're just showing some treasury yields at the moment across the world. We have this global bond market rally. So you say we're going to get more easing from the ECB than the market expects, because right now it's pricing at 175 basis points. So what do we get and what does that do to duration in Europe? I, I don't think it's about the amount of easing. It's more about timing. So they're pushing them back about when they are easing. Uh, but I think market pricing of starting around March um, or the meeting after that, so the second or the third meeting, I think that is a credible uh, view. And then we just go from there. But sticking uh, with the ECB, you know, one other thing to look at uh, in the context of duration, uh, they announced um, more QT, you know, by unwinding the PEPP um, starting the second half of next year. Will they be in a position to actually uh, execute that? And is the market going to be ready for supply, even though they do want duration uh, right now. So quite a few moving parts at this point. Uh, so yes, there is a duration play uh, heading into next year. But just to put things in context, uh, so we saw like standard three, four standard deviation moves um, throughout December. It's going to be very hard uh, to repeat that you know, heading into January. So after a correction, yes, I think flow has been head back in. But then the race that you mentioned, it truly begins. And I do think the Fed is going to be losing that race in terms of who cuts first. Okay, so, so they're, they're possibly going to have to go first and go earlier. Does that say something more malevolent about the scale of recession here in the United States of America? Thankfully, you've studied the Psalm rule. Uh, I haven't got the depth of, of, of quant knowledge Jeffrey, on that. just for us, could you quiz problem? Manus yeah. on it? Because that would be a lot of fun. No, I'm well, just kidding. Well, <laughs> actually, it indicates when global recessions Yes, it up. does. Um, <laughs> look, Jeff, you're, you're omniscient in, the, in this regard. Just run us through for our viewers. What is the Psalm rule? What does it matter? And where is the worst shirt globally recession-wise? Um, so looking at the strict definition, the three-month moving average of the U3 unemployment rate in the U.S. rises by 0.5 percentage points or more relative to the low during the last 12 months, right? So you know, that's explicit definition there. Uh, so applying it to Europe, you know, which is you know, what we're really focused on right now, oddly enough, U.K. and Sweden really are not doing uh, too well in that respect. The U.K. Um, quite poorly. But just to put things into context, uh, so this rule can also be satisfied if the prior employment level levels or the prior unemployment rate was far too low. So if the labor market was excessively tight, 
which in yeah. fairness there had been in certain <clears throat> European economies, then you could have that uh, push up them as well. Um, but overall, going back to the hard landing, soft landing push, I think the US definitely in the soft landing camp, but for Europe is a bit mix and match right now. Overall, I think we need to focus on the fiscal side in Europe. Can Germany get past um, this uh, constitutional wrangle with regards to the budget? Because what you don't want is fiscal contraction uh, into a cyclical downturn. But that, to be honest, is what uh, Germany is looking at right now, and they really need to resolve it. All right. I hope you guys wrote all that down because there is going to be a quiz. I've got, the, I've, got, I've got the print out here with, with <laughs> yellow highlights on it. So, you know, don't, don't say that I don't Claudia read the notes. on the phone right now. Yeah. As we speak. The show, we'll all quiz each other. But uh, Jeff, let's stay in Europe. Uh, I want to go back to what you said about basically the ECB's credibility, because obviously the market is pushing rate cuts. And just today, I thought it was interesting. You had uh, Governing Council member Robert Holzman coming out and saying rate cuts in 2024. They aren't guaranteed. Of course, he's one of the most uh, most hawkish members there. But uh, still, this pushback uh, that you're seeing from the ECB, it's just not landing. What does that say about the ECB's credibility here? Uh, well, if inflation data keeps on surprising to the downside, which it really uh, has been over the last two or three prints, uh, uh, then your credibility is damaged. We saw it on the way up, right? Transitory, transitory, transitory all the time. And it turns out it wasn't transitory. So that's when you lose credibility. So the last thing central bankers anywhere right now want is to have lost some credibility on the way up and you lose it on the way down as well. So this is where they need to be really attuned to uh, right now. So I just question, you know, what is euro dollar doing up here? Yes, it is a Fed story, but can you justify having a very strong euro right now with the export environment very weak? You mentioned China being uh, quite weak as well. And also we've seen a downturn in the labor market as well. You look at job openings in France and Germany, they finally started to soften heading into December. So that services element in Europe, which Madame Lagarde said had been holding European wages up, that seems to be coming off as well. Look at the PMIs. So again, it's really difficult to justify based on the data, the hawkish rhetoric at this point. All right, Jeff. So I'm going to go into Japan, Bank of Japan, right? We had some comments uh, from the governor saying that uh, that the BFJ can reach a judgment on policy before complete wage figures from small and medium sized figures come out. He did an interview with NHK. So how are you thinking about Japan, this policy of negative rates that has been in existence for so long? Do we start to see some kind of shift in 2024? Can they yes, actually they do have it? To shift. Um, they will absolutely have to shift, and the yen is going to be very much a part of that equation. Uh, we do see a material drop in dollar yen, so the yen is going to be one of the best performing currencies um, heading into uh, next year. Uh, and also, let's just go back to what they're actually doing. So, leaving the rhetoric aside, they're tweaking their bond purchases as well, um, leaving more scope and for yields to go higher. So, it is happening. They will do it at their own pace, judge it on data, judge it on wages, as you mentioned. Um, but you know, net net, they know that importing inflation via a weaker yen, that doesn't work anymore. It is a problem and it is going to be one of the tweaks, one of the, the, the major shifts heading um, into next year. Uh, and, and to be frank, Asia needs it as well. So on top of that, if the yen is allowed to strengthen, I think it will allow a lot of other central banks in Asia to let their currencies um, move a bit more uh, as well, uh, especially on the strengthening side, especially those still with a bit more inflation to worry about. But net net, that's going to be the seminal story in APAC of course, on top of whatever China does with respect to growth. The two ores are going to define what happens to the dollar recession and rates. Your call is a soft landing uh, and the market has 150, 160 basis points of rates cuts. The question I have for you then is soft landing in the United States of America. Is that short the dollar, sell the dollar on the rates uh, and a risk on narrative? Does that define a lower dollar 2024? So on a trade weighted basis, the dollar has absolutely peaked, right? But, but pick your dollar shorts carefully. And there's still plenty of opportunities for dollar long. So uh, like euro dollar, I think, should be heading back to parity. You know, given what I've just said about ECB easing timing uh, uh, cuts and, and the Fed's going to be later than that. So I certainly will not be short the dollar on the euro leg. Dollar versus Asia, I just mentioned, you know, probably the dollar is going to soften a bit as well. Also, on a trade weighted basis, one of the two most important trading uh, partners for the US, close to home, Canada and Mex. Those are going to be very, very interesting pairs as well. And I do think Latin American carry trades, they've run their course. Bank of Mexico are going to start easing rates. So the dollar can pretty much hold its own, maybe against Canadian dollar and the Mexican peso. And that is going to be material for U.S. financial conditions as well, especially for the exporters. Jeff, you're a rock star. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And happy Always new year. Fun. Jeff Yu of BNY Mellon joining us uh, on this, we uh, not Wednesday, it's Thursday, everybody. I know. It's one of those weeks. Hey, yeah, listen. so much fun with this. 
Coming up at 7.30 a.m., Kathy Wood of ARK Invest. See what she has to say as the NASDAQ is set for its best year since 1999. Tottenham are enjoying a strong season in the English Premier League, sitting in fourth place despite uh, changing the coach uh, prior to the campaign and selling their best player. Bloomberg's Jonathan Farrell sat down with Tottenham's chairman, Daniel Levy, and to talk about the big issue. The influx of Saudi money into football, the future of the club, and the sale of Harry Kane to Bayern Munich. So Harry was willing to stay but he wasn't willing this summer to sign a new contract he didn't say that to me that he wants to leave he didn't say that he would never sign a new contract but he wouldn't commit this summer and of course we were in a very difficult position had one year on his contract and as a club as i said we're self-sufficient we couldn't live in a dream that he would sign a contract we had no guarantee and therefore when Bayern Munich came along, he was willing to go to Bayern Munich and we agreed a deal. You've since disclosed there is a buyback clause. That's getting a lot of attention and a lot of fans excited. Can we talk about the terms of that buyback clause? What is it? Uh, if I'm honest, I think you know, the actual precise detail of the contract with Bayern Munich should remain confidential. All I would say is if, if Harry one day wants to come back to the Premier League um, and he wants to come to Tottenham, we would have the ability to... to We've talked a lot about Saudi Arabia and the disruption in this summer transfer window, not just for English football, but for the whole of European football. Are you getting players knocking the door now saying, I've seen Neymar's contract in the newspaper and I want a slice of that? Has this changed things for you? Mm, I think you have to look at the Saudi Arabia situation as, you know, it gave a huge influx of of money into the market. Uh, The market is particularly tough outside of the UK at the moment. Um, and I don't see that what's happening in Saudi Arabia is going to have any direct bearing in terms of player contracts in, in Europe. What do you expect it will change? Well, it's another market for players to look to. Uh, not every player will want to, to go to Saudi Arabia, but just as not every player wants to go to Germany or France or, or wherever. Joe Lewis has got his own legal problems. He's transferred his holding of the football club to family trust. We understand that dynamic and how things have changed in the last couple of years on that front. Technically, that means you no longer have that big billionaire backer. Do you need one to succeed? Is that something that Tottenham needs? Well, firstly, you know, the the ownership of Tottenham has has been of no relevance to the operations of Tottenham for the last 20 plus years. It's always been self-sufficient. As far as, you know, very wealthy people owning football clubs, as I said, the new rules now are going to be engineered to such an extent that hopefully you don't need to be a very wealthy owner in order to have a successful club. Would you be open to selling a stake? I've always, my answer to that question has always been the same for 23 years. We have 30,000 shareholders um, who own approximately 13.5%. We run this club as if it's a public company. If anyone wants to make a serious proposition to the the board of Tottenham, we will consider, consider it along with our advisors. And if we felt it was in the interest of the club, we would be open to anything. Has anyone made an offer? Over the years, many people have made offers, but there's never been an offer that's been... Well, give us an idea of what those offers have looked like. Where have they come from? Uh, All parts of the world. Um, The Far East, uh, the Middle East, America. Um, But nothing has has been put on our table that uh, we felt has been in the interest of shareholders. The stadium's been a big project for you, and clearly that's right for the club, and other people are starting to copy you as well. How big of an initiative has that been for Tottenham Football Club and how do you think it's going to really underpin the success in not just years to come but potentially decades? I think people don't realise how big a project building a stadium is. Um, You know, that project took us probably about 17, 18 years from start to finish. Um, I think you've got to take a very, very long-term view. I think that it obviously has a major impact on the club, positive and negative, because, you know, you you don't build a stadium for nothing. A multi-purpose stadium as well. It's not just about football anymore, is it? It's music, concerts, it's about everything everything else and all above. Well, that was done for two reasons. One is, you know, when you look at the cost of building a stadium, you're talking about such huge sums of money. In our case, it was one and a quarter billion pounds. I think today it would be over two billion. Wow. And you have to find ways of paying paying for that asset. And just having football club, football, 
games is not enough of income to So what generate. does music bring in, Daniel? Give me an idea of what a Taylor Swift, <laughs> Beyonce <laughs> music concert brings in for Tottenham. How much money can you make from something like that? Well, every concert is different. Um, every, so it's not just concerts, it's boxing, rugby, all, all sorts of events. You're not going to justify uh, spending the money by all those other events. What they do, though, they make a contribution to the capital cost. Um, I would say that you know, over a full year, we may make 20, 30 million pounds of additional revenue as a result of that. And what's the gate receipts look like just in terms of football over a season? How does that compare? How does that stack up? Well, our gate receipts now are over, uh, over £100 million. Big Ange has come after Antonio Conte and Jose Mourinho. Can we talk about dealing with difficult characters? What was it like dealing with Antonio Conte near the end? Um, do you know, I had a good relationship with both, with, both, with both Jose and Antonio. They're different. And, you know, as I said to my fan forum a couple, uh, last night... I said to them, you know, we, I made a mistake. Right? Mistake, they are great managers. They were just not right for this club. Um, and you know, the, the way they want to win is different, really, for how we need to win. What does that mean? They're proven winners. They've yeah, won before. They are, what does that mean? I think, so I think there's a couple of things. I think our style of football that our fans crave for is we want attacking football. And if that means winning 4-3, then so be it. Whereas I think their style of football is... You know, they don't mind being defensive and winning 1-0. And we were in a situation where we were so desperate to win. I think at that moment in time when I go back, you know, four or five years ago, um, I think we would have won, taken any way of winning. But we didn't win. And therefore, when you don't win, you get a very disgruntled fan base with our fans. Where did the pressure come from to begin with to hire names like that? I was listening to the recent fan forum you did. And you mentioned that certain players wanted a certain kind of manager. You alluded to that. I'm paraphrasing to some extent. Were there certain players that wanted that kind of name? Jose Mourinho and Antonio Conte? Do they come and knock the door and, and ask for that? It wasn't, it wasn't about the name. It was about they wanted to win, just as much as I did. And then we'd, gone, we'd come so close with Maurizio, who was a great, a great manager, and he um, did fantastic things for this football club. And we, were got, we got frustrated. And I think we went through a phase where we said, well, let's try something different. And it didn't work. Define success for this season. Let's finish there. What is success for you this year? That's a difficult one for me to answer because I, then I think I'd be putting unfair uh, pressure on, on, my, on my new coach. Honestly, I think for us, though, we want to play football where we're entertained. We want to come to a game where we're looking forward to coming to a game. Um, where we believe we have a really good chance of winning. We just want to entertain our fans. Entertain and win? Of course win, but win with style. Winning with style, there you go. Great conversation between Jonathan and the Tottenham Hotspur chairman, Daniel Levy, having bids from all parts of the world in that conversation with Jonathan. So, He wasn't having too much fun. Ah, listen, he got a trip to London for a whole week. I don't know. I can't remember why they were there, but it was a good conversation. It was a great conversation. When it comes to the money that flows around the world, there's no doubt about it. The region that I've just left, which is the UAE and Saudi Arabia, they are voracious in terms of buying mm -hmm. English football clubs and buying star players. Saudi Arabia spent $875 million in the transfer window. I mean, that, that's number two to the English uh, clubs. So it just shows you the names, perhaps at the end of their career, Take the money, honey. <laughs> I was just yeah. looking overnight, too, the uh, last 20 hours. Uh, Tottenham personally telling about three senior stars that they can leave the club. I know the January transfer, I guess, coming up. So this happens among the players. Yeah. <laughs> Strategically know, to, encouraged to reconsider the direction of their career. I always love when that happens. I have to say, in prepping for this show, you know, I did a lot of uh, macro <laughs> research. I learned a lot about politics, et cetera. I didn't <laughs> expect to have to brush up so much on football just watch the documentary or soccer yeah, well it's ronaldo look at ronaldo he went to saudi arabia he got yeah. special dispensation in terms of how he lives how his lifestyle is which takes us to one of the other and we'll talk about this story a little bit later on there's one of the big uh, you know sovereign wealth funds in the world has decided to trim some of their exposure to saudi and to other gulf nations because of a whole host of reasons not least uh, because of human rights so that you know there, there's lots of different pros and cons with now is the time to invest in saudi 
Mm. Yeah, I think it's versa. interesting. Listen, there's so much money in sports, whether it's football, whether it's, you know, um, football overseas, or globally, football yeah. here in the United States, and you see it, whether it's the streaming folks, whether it's traditional linear television and broadcast, but that is where there's an awful lot of money, and you, it makes sense that you see um, a lot of attention being paid to it, uh, and a lot of folks paying up big time, whether it's for players or for teams. All right. We're going to shift away a little bit from sports, but coming up next, we've got Sonia Martin of DZ Bank uh, getting her thoughts on certainly uh, the environment when it comes to 2024. She's coming up in just a moment. Stay with us. This is Surveillance, and this is Bloomberg. The key to 2024 is to be well diversified. At this point, you're really trying to time it, right, to wait for any increase in rates. This policy normalization that we see and slowing in the economy is going to be a boon for the duration trade in 2024. In the last four to five weeks, risk on is now taking precedence over risk off. This rally that, that we're seeing now, um, you know, was sort of the pain trade and evidence. You know, I, I've been calling it weaponized FOMO. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. From New York City, for our audience worldwide, a very good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, live on Bloomberg TV and radio. Alongside my cohort, Carol Masser and Katie Greifeld. I'm Manish Kranny. A very good morning to you. Double nickel. It's a phrase that we use when you put a futures order in. 55% that is. That's what the Nasdaq has done. 55% this year. Don't get the order wrong. Don't screw it up. And that is set for the best year since 1999. Where was I in 1999? <laughs> Trading bonds badly. You weren't buying like pets.com and things like that? I don't think Just we even had the, the internet then. I had a Bloomberg terminal. I got my first Bloomberg terminal in 1992. But it was the era where you just threw dot com off of anything. It and was. It's been like, like AI. Let's, let's buy. Let's buy. Well, is it though? I would say that the tech trade that we've seen is much more it's logical. Different. And I do feel like whether it's through social media and so on and so forth, that investments get smacked down or stories get smacked down pretty quickly and mm -hmm. play out in the markets versus maybe way back then. Well, I feel like when it comes to the story around AI, there's so many comparisons to the tech bubble, but also to the internet that maybe this mm -hmm. is as promising as the internet was and you know I wasn't you know really paying attention to the markets in 1999 but I will I do think sometimes about <laughs> thanks the Katie the horrible you can takes, shut off her mic now but the horrible <laughs> takes I would have about the internet like I would have said I'll never send an email I'll just pick up the phone so I try to keep an open yeah. mind when yeah. it comes to AI. I think the interesting thing as far as technology is concerned we've already had a couple of guests this week that are very very bullish we know that we've had Wedbush Securities talking about a four trillion dollar valuation for Apple but also referring to this moment in technological time, which is AI. It is the equivalent of what happened in 1995 when you had this technology revolution. Uh, you, had the, you had Alan Greenspan talk about a paradigm shift in technology in the 90s. So are we set for something stellar in that in regards to productivity mm -hmm. and in regards to the labor market? These, these are perhaps the, 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 the issues that we need or to debate. Or the unknowns, right, at this point in terms of the magnitude of the impact that they ultimately have. Absolutely. Or it has. And also, when does it actually translate into profits for some of these companies? Because so far, it seems like AI, of course, there could be... For NVIDIA, it's working out. It's working out for them. They're sort of the picks and shovels of it. But you think about the companies that are spending mm -hmm. really billions and billions of dollars on research uh, near term, that seems like a little bit of a margin pincher, but maybe for that great promise. Well, of course, the other uh, big narrative that we have is the bond market, a global bond market mm -hmm. rally, which is lit up. And we've had Jeffrey Yu warn us that a great great deal of the rally has already been priced in, but it is a global momentum, and that's the critical thing here. Mm -hmm. And it'll be interesting to see where the floor is ultimately. I mean, you think of the 10-year uh, Treasury yield to bring it back to the U.S. briefly, just the fantastic moves we've seen there is 3% inevitable, or you know, maybe we've um, returned to 4%. And a little bit of a reality check as I look at some of the most read stories in the past 60 minutes, half of Red Sea container ship fleet avoiding the route after attack. So again, as, as we talk about the run-up that we see, this risk on trade that we are seeing, whether it's in global bonds or whether we're talking about um, equities. Mm -hmm. I, we haven't really talked about crypto a lot in terms of the move up that we've seen it's coming up. in Bitcoin. Don't worry. It we, is we, coming we've up. Got a, we've got a full package of crypto for you with but Kathy Wood. She's going to be with us uh, in just under 30 minutes. So uh, we'll be able to talk crypto. But sorry, go ahead. No, but it's a reminder that, you know, there's stuff going on, really serious stuff going on around the world. Yeah. And we do still not, aren't quite sure when this comes to an end. If it 
you know, expands, if we see a wider conflict in the Middle East, you know, if we talk about China and so on and so forth, there's just a lot out there. Well, Anthony Blinken is on his way to he see is. what kind of passage forward can be negotiated. There's still hostage negotiations going on between the White House yeah. and the Emir of Qatar. We it's know that done. yesterday. No, not at all. Uh, there was a big give back in the oil market. Let's just check the markets yeah, for you this it. morning. A very good morning to you if you're joining us. Uh, it, it's a fairly uh, flat looking board for you this Thursday. S&P 500 yet to make that record high. Euro dollar will return to parity. That's according to Jeffrey Yu. We've just had that conversation with him. He sees a much more aggressive, harder landing in Europe relative to the US. Pick your dollar short. That would be uh, where uh, Jeffrey Yu has, uh, ha has recommended. Bonds, as we've just said, I mean, you're looking at the 2023 lows, just off those 2023 lows, 381. We dropped by 10 basis points yesterday. Fairly good, well-received auctions. My voice will last until the end of this market check. <laughs> and oil dropped by 1.9% yesterday. We add to that momentum on the downside. Is an inventory uh, build-up in Cushing. You're looking at that inventory build-up for nine weeks in a row, which seems to be trumping the geopolitical concern in the markets. Let's bring in Sonia Martin, head of FX and monetary policy at DZ Bank, and see uh, what she makes of these FX calls. Sonia, very good morning to you. Uh, the, 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 the stage is set for a soft landing, we've been told in the past two hours, and a drop in the dollar. But the last guest that talked about the dollar suggested pick your dollar uh, your dollar short very, very carefully. Um, how do you see the trajectory for the dollar going forward into 2024? 170 basis points of rate cuts are in there. Is the dollar reflecting that already? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yes, we have seen some incredibly, incredibly volatile movements in the market of late, and I think it's likely that we're going to continue to see that as we enter into 2024. I was actually just looking at a chart of euro dollar for this year, and you know, when you look at the ranges that we've been trading in, you know, you know, 105, 47 in the lows, you know, 113 or something in the highs, and we have really sort of fluctuated between people becoming very bullish, very bearish, parity calls, 120 calls, mm. very much, you know, the similar what we've seen the bond market. So I think we're going to see the same because as you just mentioned, there's so many stories happening. There's, you know, talk about rate cuts. There's the question of how severe the slowdown will be in the US, but also in the Eurozone. What's happening on the geopolitical stage? So there is a lot in the mix for this year, a lot of uncertainty. And I love the fact that you've been using this term FOMO because it describes, <laughs> I think, perfectly how investors have been rushing like mad in one direction, you know, turned around and rushed into the other direction, you know, within a matter of days sometimes. Well, Sonia, do you see in terms of global central bank policy, is it going to be a race to the bottom in 2024 when it comes to cutting mm -hmm. rates or a little bit more tempered? I think the current expectations are mass massively overdone. I mean, obviously, it all hinges upon, you know, the f further development of inflation. And, you know, we're all celebrating the fact that inflation has come down. Although, I mean, I don't know how it's for you guys. Personally, I don't really feel that things are I don't cheaper. either. No. <laughs> um, and, they, and they're not. Let's face it. I mean, inflation at 3% seems great when you dealt with 10% a while ago, but 3% still means it's getting more expensive. It's just not getting expensive as fast as before, but it's not getting cheaper. And the problem is that this last in a mile on the inflation development is probably going to be quite sticky. So we're probably going to see a renewed pickup in inflation in early 2024. That should dampen rate cut expectation. I think central banks want to cut rates, obviously, um, but they won't be able to do that until the inflation has come down more significantly, and especially the core inflation rate has fallen. So I think it's going to be later than what the market is currently expecting, and therefore also not be as aggressive as what the market is currently pricing in. So yeah. data dependent. Data dependent. We've <laughs> yeah. heard that one before. It will be fascinating to uh, see that last mile of inflation mm. play out. But let's talk a little bit more about the uh, sort of rate differentials, expected rate differentials between the ECB and the Fed, because I think it's striking uh, that you've seen the euro rise to the strongest level since July versus the dollar. Then you take a look at market expectations for the ECB to move more quickly and more aggressively than the Fed. Yeah. How does that translate into the euro dollar pair, especially against this strength that we've seen? It, it doesn't really make sense, uh, if we're being honest. I mean, it doesn't really fit together uh, how this aggressive pricing and rate cuts should go hand in hand, you know, in the eurozone particularly, goes hand in hand with the stronger euro. Of course, you could always argue the, the economy side, right? You can always argue that rate cuts are positive because they mean less pressure points on the economy. And that way you could argue that rate cuts are something currency positive. Um, I mean, you know, I've been in this business for more than 25 years. You know, at this point, you can argue it either way, whatever story you want to tell. 
hell. And I think that's what the market is doing. Um, I think the ECB isn't anywhere near as close to cutting rates. And they've been telling us this quite repetitively in recent months. But people aren't listening. And I think they won't listen until the data is there. And we are expecting inflation in the eurozone to pick up again early in 2024 and i think when that happens the narrative is going to change again and as mm-hmm. far as the euro dollar move is concerned i mean let's not forget this is you know christmas now it's between the years it's really quiet it's thin liquidity i wouldn't put too much focus on what we're seeing today and the next couple of days and wait for you know sort of the second week of january yeah, the second week of January. Uh, maybe there's actually some volume and trading activity coming back mm. into the market. But I want to talk about China because uh, at the top of the show, we spoke to a contrarian bull on China, which was a very interesting conversation since sentiment there seems to be in the gutter. But you write in your notes that China will not be a positive story next year. If that's yeah. the case, what does that mean for Europe? Well, I mean, as you correctly said, I mean, China is, in our view, definitely not a positive story. Um, I mean, we have plenty of problems. You know, the real estate sector is still very wobbly. You know, we have a demographic issue. I mean, you know, high debt levels. I mean, there there is a lot of problems in China. So China does not provide any sort of growth impetus. And this is something we will feel quite keenly in Europe. Obviously, we have already a very weak economy obviously Germany being particularly hard hit at the moment. But generally throughout Europe, we're having pretty weak growth and we're not going to get a positive sort of kick from from China. And that means that even though we are expecting things to pick up slightly in Europe, it will remain very anemic. You know, we're not talking about solid growth because, you know, honestly, where should it come from? Let's just finish off briefly with the UK because there was this moniker just before Christmas, stagnation nation. We've done the survey. Bloomberg talked to 52 economists. We're going to skirt that. It'll be 0.3% growth for next year. But if we're misunderstanding what the ECB is going to do, how mistaken are we in terms of what the Bank of England is going to do? Cable trades at 127, 80, it's had a nice run. Does it endure? No, I don't think so. I think, uh, again, that it seems overdone to me. I mean, you know, it was said early this year that we had, I keep getting mixed up with the years now, but I think it was early this year when this cable did really well for a while on the back of the fact that the UK economy wasn't doing as bad as mm-hmm. expected. So I think we've seen we've seen that again happening now. There's a sort of slightly positive surprise there. But inflation in the UK is still really high. And the Bank of England won't be able to cut rates anywhere as fast as the market is currently hoping. So same story here. Uh, and also then, therefore, Sterling, definitely not a winner for 2024. OK, well, certainly Bailey and Lagarde have been hammering home that message and that we mm. are too presumptuous and too uh, presuming of, of when and the size and the scale of rate cuts that we're going to get. Sonia, let's see uh, what is delivered in 2024. We wish you a happy new year in advance. I'm sure we'll see you in 2024. Sonia Martin there uh, of DZ Bank. Uh, and if you're just joining the program, let's check out what the markets are doing. You've got the S&P 500 at 48.33. That is flat down 0.01 percent. Yeah, unchanged. I'm going to do it. I'm going to go for you. There we go. Just for you. It's, it's interesting, Sonia's point about the ECB, which yeah. was, we're not listening. Mm-hmm. We're, we're, we've all got like cloth ears. We're obsessed <laughs> by 150 basis points of cards, 160, 170, whatever. It, change, it changes each week in the US. Likewise, in Europe, you're not going to get this scale of red cuts. Inflation is going to be sticky. And therefore, putting maybe a floor under that euro dollar that you have there, S&P futures are flat. But where, where the big trades seem to be is in FX. You know, you've got Jeff mm-hmm. calling parity mm-hmm. yeah. on the euro dollar. Which is the other side of that trade. Yeah. And uh, I love FX because it's really a zero sum game. You know, it's uh, very easy to follow in that way. And I just I also keep going back to Jeff uh, Yu's point that you keep bringing up is that uh, when you think about your dollar short, you have to be very careful there. You have to be very selective. Uh, Maybe it's not in Europe, but certainly you look around the world and there's plenty of opportunity. And I would just say that I think it's interesting that we've seen in some of the guest notes and some of the conversations that the difference between what equity markets are telling us versus what the fixed income markets are telling us. And one of them is going to get it right. It's not the first time that we've seen this division, right, in terms of what market activity is showing us, but we'll see ultimately. Yeah, you think about the pricing for the ECB and then you take a look at the uh, euro strength against the dollar. It doesn't make a ton of sense right now. Well, the debate is going to 
going to be if you've got such a demise in rates in Germany, in the UK, in that, and in the US? Is it something much more malevolent in the economy? We're going to get some jobless numbers a little bit later on mm -hmm. today. We've had the auctions. They've all gone uh, very, very well throughout uh, the week. In anticipation of those lower rates, right? Absolutely. Uh, so front, front running our own optimism. <laughs> uh, coming up, we're going to catch up with Isaac Boltanski, Director of Policy and Research at BTIG, right here on Bloomberg this Thursday morning. A very good morning. geopolitics. President Biden has got a significant problem with younger generation voters. Uh, part of this is due to the economy and inflation, but a big part of it too is this uh, perception that uh, you know, Gaza is a humanitarian catastrophe. So um, the, the presidential election is very well going to be influenced by, by events in Israel. James Lucia, the senior political analyst over at Capital Alpha Partners. Uh, as we waken up to Anthony Blinken setting off, setting forth to the Middle East uh, on his trip, what is going to come from that? That's one of the big questions uh, that we have. If you're just tuning in, it's gone 7.16 in New York. It's fairly flat on these markets. You've got, ah, we've got a hint of green, Katie, uh, 48.34. <laughs> uh, but still, really, the powerhouse is in the NASDAQ, up 55%, mm -hmm. outperforming the S&P 500. Euro dollar we've had today so far a call of parity on the show yeah. for the euro dollar next year and we've also had you know a floor listen to Lagarde she's not going to cut rates as aggressively as we all anticipate that was from uh, DZ Bank just there now and 10 year use just ticking up ever so slightly 381.28 yeah um, that was after we broke 380 yesterday for the first time since July. So the size and scopes uh, really look across asset classes, and uh, it's pretty eye-popping. It does feel like everybody's kind of squeezing in some gains, right, just before uh, the end of the year. Um, but it's just kind of limping towards it, it yes. feels like, in some ways. Uh, I'm just curious how it sets up then for the new year. Yep, uh, and don't forget, we've got that one theme, which is all the money sitting on the sidelines, and where does that get invested into? Uh, weaponized FOMO. We can come back to that. Mm -hmm. with oh, Kathy we will. Will. We will. We will. We will. <laughs> uh, but geopolitics are, are front and yes. center, and I think, as you have said uh, through the morning, one of the most read stories on the Bloomberg Terminal is about the, the amount of global trade that is potentially at risk because of the flare-up in the Red Sea uh, and the issues uh, from some of the proxies of Iran. Isaac Boltanski is the Director of Policy of Research over at BTIG. Isaac, a very good morning to you. Uh, we're setting the table for Blenkin's visit to the Middle East. We just had one guest who said to us, look, Biden needs to pivot. He's now got a huge problem in terms of younger demographics in various swing states on his position on Israel. Does he have a growing political issue that could really challenge him as he goes into this election year in 2024 on the position of the Hamas-Israel war? Good morning. Good morning. Look, I think that the White House is undoubtedly concerned with early polling numbers regarding young voters. And when you really look at that segment, the 18 to 29 year old segment, you've seen real slippage of the president's support. Uh, you know, there are a number of polls, one that I continue to look at that focuses exclusively on key battleground states, the seven states that will decide this election. And Biden's leading by one or two points at most in those battleground states. And so, look, there is undoubtedly a concern regarding these young voters. And it may be the Middle East. It may be student loans. It can be any number of things. But what I hear when I talk to Democrats, and this is something that I believe they're going to repeat to themselves for, for, the, for the foreseeable future, is it seems as though young voters dislike the Democratic Party on every day of the year except Election Day. And so it's very easy to extrapolate and expand on some of the disaffected uh, dynamics in that younger voter segment. But when they actually get to the polls and when they're actually asked to pull a ballot, uh, pull a lever supporting either Biden or Trump, which is what it looks like will be the likely uh, matchup, Democrats still feel relatively comfortable that younger voters will show up. Well, two things I wanted to ask you. I mean, how much are you betting that it is indeed another matchup between Biden and Trump? Having said that, also the outcome for President Biden, how important is it who he is ultimately running against come November? 
Sure. Look, right now, it's I found it interesting over the past few months, Democrat and Republican contacts. Democrats continue to say there's a, a chance President Biden will step back. Uh, Republican uh, contacts continue to say, look, maybe there'll be support that coalesces around Nikki Haley or someone else who is ultimately able to overtake Trump. As soon as she figures I out think- that slavery was part of why we had a civil war. Actually, it was why we had a civil war. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but go ahead. Well, look. Look, I'm just saying at this point, there's a fair amount of hopium coming from from, you know, the traditional bases of of both parties. And the reality is, when you look at the numbers and you look at the way that our primary system works with a lot of these states being winner take all from a delegate perspective, you have to assume that it's Biden v. Trump. What I am most focused on, Carol, and I think what investors are going to have to remain cognizant of for the next year is the last election between Biden and Trump was decided by 44,000 people in three states. And so that's when we have to really start layering in how third party candidates could impact the calculus for voters in, in key swing states. I mean, I care. I think we all as Americans care about the outcome because we are looking at I'm looking at the balance of power newsletter this morning. uh, Risks of a new global war talking about conflicts overlapping from West Africa through Ukraine to the Middle East. You know, this time in terms of maybe another global war, uh, World War Three, perhaps that it starts with a bang, Um, you know, not with one big kind of incident, but several things kind of brewing around the world. And I think who ultimately is in the White House is going to be really important and facing a lot. So how do you think about kind of what kind of global situation, geopolitical situation we might all be facing come November? Yeah, look, I think I think we need to be as humble as possible, right? No one in my seat was talking about uh, the a war in, in Israel uh, four months ago, mm-hmm. right? Um, no one was talking about the Red Sea a month ago. And so we need to be humble and understanding that there are no clear mile markers on the road ahead from a geopolitical perspective, but we can understand how we as a country respond to those. And so that's been part of the struggle for the White House in getting an aid package together for Israel and Ukraine, which traditionally was pretty darn easy. Right. That's something that you would have seen cruise through um, with 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 almost unanimous support um, uh, just a few years ago. And so that has changed. So our ability to um, uh, for politics to stop at this at the water's edge, which has been a uh, driving force in, in American the American ethos for, for years has stopped. And right. So our own political dynamics have made it more difficult to have a unified uh, international stance. And that makes it easier for others to rise, which is what you've seen with Saudi Arabia and its attempt to become a, a global power and others. And so to me, it's more of a focus of the domestic dynamics where our own governing problems, which I don't see getting any easier in the near term, mm-hmm. make it harder for us to be the force that I think the world has grown accustomed to since World War Two. And Isaac, on that thought, I mean, uh, in late November, you published a year ahead look and you sort of took a look at the winners and losers in this uh, potential election. And I thought it was interesting that both in a Democratic White House and a Republican White House, you saw uh, the defense sector as a winner. What does that say about the year ahead and, of course, the U.S. involvement on the global stage? You know, Kay, there's this line in town, which is Democrats want a small military and they want to send it everywhere. Republicans want a big military and they don't want to send it anywhere. Um, And um, I think that's something that is 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 a a truism that investors can really sink their teeth into and that we will have continued spending on the defense side. We are going to have areas uh, that uh, flashpoints. We're also going to have continued spending on cybersecurity defense, which is something that, again, you can say is going to happen, whether there's a Republican or a Democrat in the White House. And so defense area to me is is one that is interesting because I do think it's relatively safe from the political volatility that we've seen in the past, given the world that we live in and given the defense dynamics that that I think both parties have embraced over the past few months in particular. As we go into 2024, Isaac, um, and this time next year, we're, we're, we're going to know who's in that White House, aren't we? So what is the I risk? Hope so. I hope so. I hope, <laughs> I hope so, hopefully too. so, yes. We, we don't necessarily want to rerun. I remember all broadcasts afterwards because we were still waiting for the yes. outcome. I, I, we, I think we were all up for a very, mm-hmm. very long time, weren't we, uh, over that two-week period of time. But very briefly, um, what is the risk if there's a shift in the presidency that some of the big Biden uh, policies, the Inflation Reduction Act, et cetera, get U-turned, 
changed? And does that have an impact at all? Yeah, this is something that, again, we're trying to separate um, signal and noise for investors. The Inflation Reduction Act and its $400 billion in green energy tax credits is safe. You can say that with emphatic certainty, even though President, former President Trump says that he wants to repeal it. That's a very certain simply, certainty. <laughs> it simply will not happen. And here's one reason why. Some studies have suggested that early dollar flows from the IRA mm -hmm. have benefited Republican districts okay. right. um, uh, by and large. Almost 80 percent of the early dollars are going to red districts. And that's the brilliance of the IRA. They structured them as tax credits mm -hmm. and Republicans don't like getting rid of tax credits. Not at all. And cuts. Isaac, we got to cut it there. Thank you so much for being with us, uh, finishing off uh, with an issue on tax. She's up next. Queen of Tech, Kathy Wood. For our audience worldwide, a very good morning. It's Bloomberg Surveillance live on Bloomberg TV, Bloomberg Radio. Alongside me, the crew, Carol Massa, Katie Greifeld, and a very warm welcome. I'm Manus Cranny. Snapshot of risk as we go to 7.29, nearly 7.30. Uh, we've got a little hint of green on the S&P 500. The Nasdaq uh, up a quarter of 1%. Of course, it is the darling of the world. It's up 50%. 5%. The Magnificent Seven's performance in the back half was not as resplendent as it was in the first half relative uh, to the indexes at all. Russell 2000 down by two tenths of 1%. Roll it over. Uh, have a look at the rest of the markets because you are looking at yields ticking higher ever so slightly. Very strong, robust uh, bond market auctions throughout uh, the past 24 hours. You're looking at a uh, nice move down in 10 year bond yields, two fives and tens down by 10 basis points each. So the bond markets took the auctions quite well. Uh, let's see how we go a little bit later on today. It's a global bond market rally, by the way. Uh, global bond markets are up by 10%, double digit, in November and December. So there is a world beyond borders. Uh, that's the state of play on the bond markets. Will we endure? And there you have the euro dollar. We have a call already from Jeffrey Yu this morning talking about parity. Be careful which dollar short you choose because parity is on the way, uh, according to Jeffrey Yu. And our second guest at DZ Bank said, uh, of course, Lagarde is right. Inflation will be sticky. They will not cut as aggressively as the market presumes. Snapshot of under surveillance this morning, 7.31. This is what we've got for you. We're waiting for data. Regional Fed uh, Reserve Banks are expecting the labor market to cool in 2024. The Philly Fed saying manufacturing employment expectations expectations are at the weakest since 2009. According to the Dallas Fed, the number of Texas manufacturers expecting an increase in jobs is at the lowest level since the start of the pandemic. The final jobless claims, as I say, that piece of the slate will come for 2023 in about an hour's time. We will break that for you. Apple resumes the sale of its latest smartphone watches in the stores after an appeal court ruled on lifting a ban. The company is in a patent dispute with Massimo over the blood oxygen sensor. And Apple says the Watch Series 9 and Ultra 2 models will resume online sales by noon Pacific time. Now, one of Cathy Wood's ETFs is shaking up its Bitcoin-related holdings, according to Bloomberg. The ARK Next Generation Internet ETF sold all shares in Grayscale Bitcoin Trust while buying 4.3 million shares in ProShares Bitcoin Strategy ETF. Bitcoin is more than doubled this year on hopes that the SEC will approve that holy grail, the spot Bitcoin ETF in the coming weeks. We're waiting. Beta breath. We are all waiting. And so is Kathy Wood. And she joins us on this Thursday. Kathy Wood, of course, founder, CEO and CIO of ARK Invest. Um, Kathy, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. So great to have you here. Um, Let's start there with the news, because we do have this story on the Bloomberg. Tell, tell us a little bit about this overhaul and your thinking when it comes to how you are um, thinking about the investment strategy for you guys specifically when it comes to crypto. Sure. And uh, Merry Christmas. Very happy to be here again, Carol, Katie, and Massa. Uh, so we're, uh, we're as optimistic about uh, Bitcoin as we ever have been, um, but there, were, there are a few regulatory and tax uncertainties 
Uh, and uh, we had been waiting for the discount uh, between uh, GBTC and NAV to, to narrow. It was as high as 50 percent at one point last year when there was great uncertainty around all of the turmoil in crypto generally. And now it's a single digit. Uh, and there are now other products out there that uh, we can use to gain exposure to Bitcoin in this moment. And it's just a moment of uncertainty between now, we think, and um, January, January 8th to 10th, somewhere in that range, perhaps. Uh, but we, out of an abundance of caution, didn't want to take any risk. Mm -hmm. And I mean, let's get a little bit specific here because we're talking about the ARK Next Generation Internet ETF. The ticker there is ARK W. And I think what caught a lot of people's attentions is that you uh, completely sold down your remaining stake of the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. Instead, on the same day, uh, you bought into the ProShares Bitcoin Strategy ETF. Of course, that tracks uh, Bitcoin futures. It doesn't actually hold the physical Bitcoin. Can you explain that shuffle? What was the thinking there? Sure. Um, a couple of things. First of all, um, BIDO, the ProShares, is already approved. There's no regulatory uncertainty having to do with it. Uh, uh, so we chose to maintain our exposure through BIDO uh, for the time being. And uh, as I mentioned before, there are some uh, tax and regulatory uncertainties still as part of this process. Uh, we don't know exactly who's going to be approved and uh, and whether they've met all the uh, criteria that the SEC has put before us. Uh, we know we have, uh, but uh, we don't know if others, including GBTC, have. We just we just don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, so so again, out of an abundance of caution and GBT's discount again, it was as much as fifty percent relative to NAV. So not only have we enjoyed this year the run in Bitcoin itself, but we've had the nice closing of that discount. So it's been, uh, you know, double good news for us. But you've talked about January 10th, Kathy, I think in another report. Is that possible, whether it's you or somebody else in terms of the first um, spot Bitcoin ETF actually getting approval? Uh, well, we think the probabilities have gone up because the SEC has been highly engaged compared to what was happening before. Before, it was just denying approval, denying approval. Uh, and we just kept putting our uh, filing in again, you know, try, and <laughs> try, 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 you know, yeah. dogged and determined. And uh, so here we are. We think we're we're first in line, and that's why there is this uh, January 10th deadline. Um, but we like the idea that the SEC has been so engaged, and it's not just with us; it's others as well. We think a number of uh, uh, a number of funds could be approved at the same time, uh, and they've been asking not only one set of questions but follow-up questions. And uh, again, that's a very good sign. Well, speaking of and, engaged, oh, go ahead, please. No, no, no. Yeah, finish. the last few questions have been very technical mm. and uh, and so more de rigueur and you know you'd expect them to be asking these questions as we head toward an approval now it's not 100 percent certain and uh, so we want to make that clear as well um, this is the SEC and uh, we never know you know what might happen along the way regulators can be tricky that's for sure hey listen you mentioned engagement let's talk about engagement with your funds overall and especially the arc innovation fund up 72 percent year to date easily outperforming uh, some of the major uh, market benchmarks still down 65 percent from the high back in February of 2021 for you though, a lot of critics. We bring up your name, we bring up ARC, and you have a lot of fans and you have a lot of critics. There's a lot of discussion. Does it feel, though, a little bit like a victory lap this year? Uh, well, you know, we are very happy that a couple of things have happened. Uh, that this idea that interest rates were going to continue moving higher uh, has been proven incorrect. And uh, I think even the Fed while there is that small possibility, even the Fed is now starting to talk about the other side of the interest rate move. And so I, I do believe all we've seen so far is a reaction to that macro phenomenon or, or judgment call. Um, we went through our, our uh, flagship strategy and all of our strategies went through a very difficult time from February 21 through December of 22 
as interest rates, first of all, were presumed uh, to move up or forecasted mm -hmm. to move up. And then when they did move up, so it was almost like a double discounting. Mm -hmm. And so we've seen the first installment of um, the the uh, the correction there to the upside for our funds uh, with this notion. And it's, again, the forecast that interest rates will come down. And, you know, we, we would presume that if they do come down, uh, for the reasons we think they're going to come down, m the most important one being deflation, then our funds will will uh, be in good shape because we are very, uh, our, our companies uh, thrive on deflation. Technologically enabled innovation is deflationary. So Kathy, a very good morning to you. It's Manus, first time we, we've met on. Uh, so we're going to move to a deflationary environment. We'll come back to the big macro call in a moment. Just let's square it away before I talk to you about the flows in the funds, which is how much interest rate cuts do you presume are you forecasting? Leave the forecast of everybody else aside. We'll what do, you, what do you presume will happen next year? Well, we put up a chart uh, in one of our in the, no, in the Nose, which is a, a YouTube video that I do every, every month, Employment Friday. And in that chart, you will find uh, a, a, a ratio. It's the metals uh, to gold ratio. Mm -hmm. So metals price to gold price. Uh, and there has been an extremely tight correlation between that ratio and long-term interest rates. In October, we, we published it, or early November, mm -hmm. and what you will see is that there was a very wide gap that had developed. The metals to gold ratio was near its low for the past 12, 15 years, and interest rates were at their highs, uh, 5%. The correlation, if you just eyeballed that chart, the correlation suggested that rates should go to 2%. Now, maybe they won't go all the way to 2%, but we think that long-term interest rates are way above where they're going to okay. end up because of deflation. Okay, yes. well, let's, we'll come back to that and see whether we get to the 2% level. I've got to ask you about the flows into the funds, which is... Obviously, you know, as Carol just said, you, you've got a bit of a victory lap going on at the moment, but this is the first year of outflows. Um, have those outflows stopped? You've had a great performance in the back part of this year. Have the outflows stopped? Um, and has that bleed stopped? Yes, well, we were very gratified at our asset retention in 21 and 22. Um, in fact, we had net inflows, if you combine both years, of more than $18 billion. Uh, and this year, uh, one w might expect uh, that those who average down into the, the very steep declines that we were seeing in 22 especially, uh, might take some profit. So we have had... Uh, I know for our flagship strategy, it's um, roughly $500 million in outflows. Maybe for all of our strategies, $1.8 million. So maybe 10% of the inflows that we enjoyed during 21 and 22. So again, we're very gratified and grateful to our, our clients for uh, the support that we continue to receive. So has the, has the outflow stopped? Uh, we have had uh, days of, on balance, very recently, yes. Uh, and I think part of this is many people do uh, uh, tax management toward the end of the year. And so some of the outflows might have been associated with, uh, uh, with uh, clients who um, got in at a high cost base and were just harvesting okay. some tax losses. But I think we're through that. Is, do you find it a little surprising, though, Kathy, considering the run-up? Or do you... I'm curious about the conversations you do have with investors considering the year that you're having and then to see those flows. It's got to be a yes, little disheartening. You know, yeah. Oh, no, 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 not at all. A actually, we put out a piece for uh, Resolute, our distributor, who, um, and, and we basically showed to, uh, them, if you rebalance our strategy when there have been big moves one way or the other, if you rebalance regularly or based on a rule like uh, when, when the fund's up 15% relative to everything else, take some profits. And what uh, it showed, that study showed that if you are disciplined that way, that um, over any rolling five-year uh, period, um, it is highly likely 
uh, almost a hundred percent. I'm not quite sure if it's quite that high, but uh, that uh, uh, that you will beat the market, uh, meaning as measured by the Nasdaq or the S and P, over a rolling five-year period. And so, uh, a lot of our funds are with advisors who are very sophisticated and uh, responded somewhat, perhaps in this tax tax management uh, part of the year, to that message. All right. Sit tight. We're going to come back, Kathy. It's amazing that we actually haven't brought up Elon or Tesla yet. So we <laughs> want to get into that as well. Um, Kathy Wood of ARK Invest, she's going to stay with us. Of course, founder, CEO, CIO of ARK Invest. Lots more in terms of the conversation. Curious to you a little bit more about AI, NVIDIA. There's just so much. Um, if you're just joining us, though, right now, folks, uh, the S&P 500, call it little change right now, uh, 4834. We're just up about one point, so call it flat in terms of a percentage basis. But more with Kathy Wood. She's coming up. Uh, quick check on the uh, 10 year, 381, a little bit higher uh, as we've talked about some of the auctions and good demand in terms of that. We're coming back in just a moment. All right, everybody, let's get back to Kathy Wood, founder, CEO, and CIO of ARK Invest. She's joining uh, Manny and uh, Manus, of course, and Katie and myself here on Bloomberg Surveillance. Um, Kathy, I feel like we can't talk, we have to talk about Tesla and Elon Musk. And I know you just had a conversation on Twitter X. Um, this has been, I think, from day one, right, in terms of you starting out, that you've had this investment in Tesla. And I remember when we first talked and you were getting started, you talked about him being the next Thomas Edison he, and how his vehicles would turn the U.S. economy upside down. Um, having said that, there's an evolution and the EV world has changed. How are you thinking? It's still a top holding. How are you thinking about the Tesla story right now? Well, um, first of all, Carol, thank you very much for letting me interview that mm -hmm. time. That was nearly 10 years ago. Ark is about to celebrate his 10th year anniversary, and you gave us that opportunity, so thank you. Um, uh, the world is evolving, actually, um, uh, I, I think, even m more closely to what we expected. Uh, because we expected a lot of traditional auto manufacturers to see the writing on the wall and rush as quickly as they could into scaling big time into electric vehicles. And what has happened recently? Both GM and Ford have said, uh, we're stepping back. Uh, we're not going to do this until uh, it's profitable. The problem with that is in order to be profitable, they need to scale. That's how this works. These are learning curves that they are uh, riding down, and those are expressed in cost declines. So the fact that they're pulling back means they're more sh there's more share for Tesla and others who choose to go for it. Mm. And uh, Kathy, I want to keep the conversation going on Elon Musk, but I want to bring it to the ARK Venture Fund. Of course, uh, it's not an ETF. You invest in private companies, et cetera, in there. And you take a look at the portfolio. You have SpaceX in there, and you also have X, formerly known as Twitter. Mm -hmm. And in July, you had told the Wall Street Journal that you had written down your Twitter stake by 47%. Fill us in on the past couple of months. Have you written it down further, or how has that changed? No, I think it's uh, still there. Um, you know, uh, we have to be very careful. This is an interval fund. It is a 40-act fund. And we have to mark to market every day. Uh, the good news is our clients can get in and have access to these amazing companies for just $500, and they get quarterly liquidity. So, so that's the good news. The markdowns are simply, you know, if we see in the secondary market employee stock trading at a steep discount, we have to take that into account. If we see others in the more traditional asset management work, world, like uh, Fidelity and others uh, marking their holdings down, uh, we need to take that into consideration during our daily mark to market. So it's an abundance of caution. We have a five-year investment time horizon. Do mm -hmm. we think that's where... X belongs in terms of valuations? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. A roughly 20-ish billion dollar uh, valuation for what we believe truly will become uh, the everything app, think WeChat Pay. Uh, Elon started his entrepreneurial career in the payments industry, and he's been thinking about this for a long time. He now has money transmitter licenses in more than half of all of the states, mm -hmm. uh, which we learned on Twitter spaces or on X spaces, 
I should say, uh, the other day when we had our interview with him. So that's exciting. He's going for it. He's going for it. Uh, we'll see if that one lands. But let's talk a little bit more about the private markets, because obviously the private credit market has gotten a lot of attention right now. You're looking at the private markets through this interval fund that you have. When you think about the opportunities there on that five year horizon that you have, do you see more so in the public markets or in the private markets right now? Uh, well, uh, now that we've had this very nice run this year, um, we think the answer to that question is in the private markets. They're close. They're close. What's fascinating to us is that the public markets have been leading the private markets for the past three years. As our funds were, uh, were falling in 21, uh, private evaluations were going to all-time highs along with the NASDAQ. They were taking their cues, I suppose, from the NASDAQ. But real innovation, if you looked at our portfolios, uh, was starting to um, revalue to the downside, and even more so in 2022. We are still seeing major down rounds taking place in the private markets. And I'm always surprised at, at this sort of thing because you would think that the private markets lead the public markets. That has not been the case in the last few years. Hey, Kathy, I've got to be honest with you. I think whenever we think about Elon Musk, brilliant, but also erratic. And I'm curious how you think about Elon, the individuals versus Elon, the companies he's creating, the things he's doing. Because I think if there is time, any other CEO of a major publicly held company would, I think it's safe to say, not be able to get away with a lot of what he has done. So help us educate us how you make sense of it, of someone you have followed, talked with for many years. Well, first of all, uh, very often we just look at what he does, not exactly what he's saying, which can often be a distraction, or it can be an advertisement for his cars or for X or, or for SpaceX uh, and so forth. So um, but we have a, a scoring system um, as we are evaluating companies and their founders and their management teams. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there are six metrics, and one of them is moat and barriers to entry. And uh, mm -hmm. I think Elon is a maestro of raising barriers to entry with innovation, which that is so much faster than anyone else. Why? Because he's so first principles physics driven in his uh, analysis of how to approach a new idea, a so, big idea. So tell me this then, Kathy. I mean, if you look at the cohort of, your, of, of the CEOs that you back, Brian Armstrong, does he hit that bar? Does he, does, is he above Elon or is he at the money? You've got Elon, you've got Brian, you've got uh, Tony Wood at Roku. Um, does anybody come close to Elon or is Brian Armstrong maybe even at the money with, with, with Elon or above? Well, uh, we don't actually look at uh, the world that way, one relative to the other in terms of management teams. We do look from our scoring system at the scores, which include moat, management people and culture, execution, evaluation, that might surprise people, and uh, product and service leadership and thesis risk. Those are the six scores. And uh, both, but, but, well, all three of them score very highly. Which one scores the highest? I, they're actually very close to one another, to be honest. They're very close to one another. So, I mean, obviously Coinbase uh, is one of your, your key holdings. We've talked a little bit about that. The, the, other, the other feature that we want to talk about is AI. Um, I'm curious to know, in OpenAI, uh, the valuations have ranged between 80 billion to 100 billion. Will you take a position in OpenAI? Is that going to be part of your holdings as you explore the next development of AI in your holdings? Well, um, in our uh, private portfolios, we uh, are already exposed to Anthropic, which has been a major beneficiary of the drama around OpenAI that uh, we all witnessed uh, a few months ago. Um, but if you look at GPT-4, which is uh, the latest large language model that, uh, that OpenAI has published, it is uh, way above others in terms of performance. So there you have it, the, the, the pros and the cons. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't tell you what we're going to do in that portfolio, but 
Uh, we are so impressed at how OpenAI has led the industry. We're also impressed, however, at the open source models. And, and we'd like to encourage more of that movement. Uh, we know that Meta Platforms has, has with Llama 2, and uh, it's working on others, is moving very quickly and uh, making great strides. So for much lower cost, uh, open source is free, uh, companies can get Close, not 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 yeah. uh, right at, at GPT four, but close. So we want to see the open source movement in in the venture fund. We also own um, Kathy. We've got a. We, we, oh, sorry. No, no, no. We we never have enough time with you. Can I ask you a really quick question? In five seconds. Sure. Any sure, new sure. ETFs coming our way from you guys next year? Well, uh, real quickly. Uh, uh, as you may know, we bought a company in London. Yeah. Uh, they have some very interesting funds. <laughs> all right. Going to leave it there. Like we said, we always leave uh, our audience wanting more from you, but we so appreciate all the time you gave us. Happy New Year. Of course, Kathy Wood, founder, CEO, CIO of ARK Invest. If you missed any of it, check it out at Bloomberg.com. Coming up, Anna Rathburn of CBiz. This is Bloomberg, everybody. <laughs>